everybody. Um, welcome to uh, Ten Speed Press Instagram Happy Hour, a, uh, a national institution that began last week. Um, I am your host this week. My name is Robert Simonson. Oh. I am a cocktail writer and cocktail author, and I have written uh, four books for said Ten Speed Press, which is an imprint of Penguin Random House. Um, my latest book. Um, is called the Martini Cocktail. There it is. Came out last fall, and this book is a uh, guess what? It's about the Martini Cocktail. It's uh, the history of the drink. It's a very low, old drink, most famous drink in the world. Goes back to the 1870s, as well as recipes of uh, different versions of that drink, as well as variations of which there are many. Um, so. What I'm going to do for you today, I'm going to make you a couple of martini, um, a couple of martinis, a couple <laughs> different martinis. Um, with me today uh, on the camera is my lovely wife, Mary Kate. Hi. Um, David Leibowitz is on, and he wants a home bar. <laughs> Hi, David Leibowitz. You are, you are my Instagram idol. You are my model. So I'm doing the best I can. Um, so what was I saying? So. Um, Sophisticated Instagram people like David Leibowitz have a thing that they can attach their phone to and then it stays stable and then they just do the selfie mode. But we don't have that and so... You uh, have me. Mary Kate is the director so we're doing it a uh, cinema verite kind of day. So if it's like, it's handheld. Brad's here. It's edgy. Hello Brad. Kenny's here. Hi Kenny. Lots of, lots of friends. Brad is another fellow 10 Speed Press uh, author, most recently of the book Last Call. All right, so what I'm going to do, two recipes. Um, the first one hails back to the 1880s, um, and the second one will be about circa 1950s, 1960s, because I want to show where the martini came from and where it went. The martini has had a very long life, and it's had many lives. Um, the martini has not always been one drink. Um, in fact, uh, its earliest form, this may surprise people, it may shock some people, because we all know the martini as a dry drink, as a uh, strong drink, uh, made of gin and dry vermouth, or vodka and dry vermouth. Um, but it actually started out as a sweet drink. Um, the first known recipes to be printed of the martini uh, were made of Old Town Gin. This is Heyman's fine product out of Europe. Um, Old Tom Gin, simply put, is a sweeter form of gin, very popular in the 19th century. And then it kind of faded away, and then it sort of disappeared completely, and it's only come back in the last 15 years because bartenders wanted it in order to make the old drinks, and some people started producing it again. Old Tom Gin, so it's made with Old Tom Gin, and it's made with sweet vermouth. What? No, not dry vermouth, sweet vermouth. That was the original martini, plus some bitters and maybe a little simple syrup. So it was a very different kind of drink. Um, so I'm going to be using the Heyman's. I'm also going to be using the Martini and Rossi. Very um, familiar brand and an important brand in the history of the Martini because, as you can see, they share a name. Um, there are many theories as to where the Martini got its name. Nobody really knows. Hannah and Charles and Julie are all here. Hi, Hannah, Charles, and Julie. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, one of the many theories on how the martini got its name is it took its name from this brand of vermouth. And it's actually the theory that requires the smallest leap of logic. Uh, back in the 19th century, vermouth was fairly unknown. Uh, there weren't many brands in the United States, but one of the brands that was in the United States was Martini and Rossi. It wasn't called Martini and Rossi then, it was just Martini. Um, who knows how Rossi got into the picture? <laughs> Some, somewhere down the line. Um, so, Anybody making a martini in the 1880s, this is what they could find. And they couldn't find the dry. They could only find the sweet. Um, so this drink is actually the uh, first recipe for a martini. Actually, there were two recipes in 1888, one from Harry Johnson, famous bartender, and one from a much less famous bartender named Theodore Prue. I'm going to show you a picture of Theodore. It's a small obsession of mine. Um, Theodore Prue was a... Um, Chicago bartender who self-published his own bartender's manual in 1888. There he is, very handsome, mustachioed man. Uh, he was actually a French-Canadian, so, you know, 
immigrants getting the job done, as usual. <laughs> so, let's make the drink, shall we? All right, so, old Tom Chin, the recipe calls for equal parts. Get that out of the way. Everybody's Honey, having a really good time saying hello to each other. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> it's, a, it's a friendly, friendly Instagram feed. Um, nice uh, kind of uh, antique uh, martini pitcher, as you might find in the 1940s or 50s. Um, Theodore Prue would not have used it, but we are using it. So, equal parts. So here comes the Old Tom Gin. And we pour that in. Um, here's another sweet vermouth that is excellent uh, if you want to use it. Dolan. Also from France. Well, not also. Martini is from Italy. Uh, and equal parts, Martini and Rossi. Sweet vermouth. And, as Theodore Prue dictated, some <laughs> aromatic bitters. Um, Brad says it's like your Christmas party, minus the ham. <laughs> <laughs> and I am now I'm hungry for ham, Brad. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to use Angostura bitters. Uh, Theodore Prue would not have used this. Um, he would have used some other aromatic bitters. We don't really know which one. And whatever they are, they're probably been discontinued a long time ago. So a couple dashes of that. Now, um... The recipe also calls for a little simple syrup, but the drink's sweet enough, so we're going to leave it the way it is. All right, so now we're going to get some ice. One thing about a martini, no matter what kind of martini you're making, you want it to be ice cold, very, very cold. So do not spare on the ice. Build a lot of ice in your pitcher so you can stir it cold. We're using, um, we've got a lot of bar bric-a-brac in the apartment. We've got a lot of... Um, Ice, uh, what are these are called? Buckets? Ice buckets. Ice butlers? Called. Ice buckets. Um, this is our favorite, though. It's from the 60s. It's usually called the Atomic Ice Bucket. Looks like a rocket. Um, we found it at an antique store in Wisconsin uh, for steel. It would have cost so much more if we found it in New York. All right, so let's put a lot of ice in here. Okay. I'm using these little claws. They're a little difficult. But they're so pretty. <laughs> okay, that ought to do. And then stir our spoon, nice and tall, to get inside this nice tall picture. I'm looking to see if anybody has any questions, but no, no questions yet. That's fine, because I don't have any answers. <laughs> right. So you stir it a nice long time, between 15 and 30 seconds. As I said, you want to get it cold. Um, with these early martinis, uh, garnish was uh, any, any man's game. You could do an olive. Some recipes called for a lemon twist, and some recipes back then actually called for a cherry. You know, that seems crazy to us today, um, because we associate cherries with Manhattans. But indeed, they called for a cherry. And so, since we can do a cherry, we Ooh. are going to do a cherry. Ooh, somebody wants to know some of your favorite gins. You're going to go over that with the other martini? Oh, absolutely. I'm okay, going to good. get into that in just a second. Okay, good. Favorite gins. I've got Okay, a lot of and your brother wants to know if you're saying old town or old time. Uh, oh, neither. Um, I am saying old Tom. T O M. So um, there's a long story, boring story, is the way it's called old Tom <laughs> gin. I'm not going to tell it to you right now. Yay! All right, so here's the glass I'm going to use. Again, Theodore Prue would not use this glass. Excuse me a second. Um, it, but it's a small glass. I just wanted to use it to show. Um, I'm not going to use that glass. That glass is dirty. <laughs> Here. Here's another glass. Same size. So um, the martini glasses we're used to today are these big 10-ounce, uh, 12-ounce bird baths. Back then, they were much smaller. They were like this. They like a 3-ounce capacity. So when you think of that, and then you think of the three martini lunch, it all makes sense. It all comes together. Because you can drink three of those. You can't drink three of the big ones. All right. Let's see. There we go. And we're pouring the drink. Can you get in on that, Mary Kay? Oh, my gosh. Okay. As you can see, that looks nothing like a martini. Nobody would see that on the bar and say, hey, that's a martini. Give me one of those martinis. Um, it looks like a Manhattan. But, as I said, that's the way they were in the past. All right, so I'm going to put a cherry in there, plop it in. It's my own homemade cherries. Um, it's easy to make homemade cherries. I recommend you do it. Um, it it'll take you 15 minutes. Uh, use the sour cherries that are in season in July, not the sweet cherries. 
So uh, let's see if I did any. Oh, well, I did here. That's good. That's good. Um, if my friend Martin Duderoff is out there, uh, that one's for him. He's a big fan of the Sweet Martini. He's the only person I know who regularly, daily, doggedly advocates for the return of the Sweet Martini. So that one's for him. Um, in fact, with Martin, we did a, uh, an app together. You can find it on iTunes. It's a martini app, and it has that recipe in it as well as many other recipes. Michael's here. Matt Rally's here. Say hey. Hi, Matt. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Thanks for joining me um, for almost happy hour. You know, it's, it's 4 o'clock. It's 4.15. It's not quite there. It's not quite cocktail hour, but these days nobody's really counting. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's okay. Nobody's, nobody's going to fault me. Okay, next we're going to make a dry martini. Now, when people think of the martini, they think of a dry martini. That is the classic representation of that drink. So what do we mean by dry? Well, that changed. Hey, John Bonet's here. Hi, John Bonet. I think he's going to do one of these. John Bonet is going to be in this spot next Thursday at 4. Wait, we're the supposed to be social distancing. The great, no, not this spot. His own spot. <laughs> and he'll be talking about wine. Uh, I assume so. Why? Uh, anyway. So, in the old days, dry martini meant you were not using Old Tom Gin, you were using London Dry Gin. Or, you were not using Sweet Vermouth, you were using Dry Vermouth, or you were using both Dry Gin and Dry Vermouth, and that's what dry meant. So, you could have like 50% Dry Gin and 50% Dry Vermouth, and that's still a dry martini. Today, that's not how we think of it, it's about the amount of vermouth. A dry martini is a martini that has very little vermouth in it. Um, this became a mania in the 50s and 60s. Um, everybody was in pursuit of the driest martini possible, and it actually uh, produced a kind of a cottage industry of gizmos that you could buy to make sure you made the, the driest martini possible. I have a few of these because I'm a crazy cocktail collector and I have a lot of useless stuff around my apartment. So like for instance, this says vermouth on it, this had an atomizer on it once upon a time, and you would just like spray it over the top of your martini. Um, here's a, a vermouth eyedropper in sterling silver. And so you just unscrew it, drop, drop. That's all the vermouth you need. Um, let's see what else we got here. This is my favorite. This is called uh, the martini tester, gourmet martini tester. So the way this works is you would, you would, um, suction up a little bit of your martini and if one ball floats it's dry if two ball floats it's drier and three balls three balls float it's very dry um and you can tell that the people had utmost confidence in this product because on the pamphlet it says <laughs> not a gadget it works <laughs> not a gadget got it not a gadget finally this came out in the 60s Martini stones. <laughs> Martini stones, you soak the vermouth in there overnight, and then you actually take one of the stones and put it at the bottom of your martini glass, and that's all the vermouth you get. There's a joke in there. I've never there? actually tried these. As you can see, there's liquid in there. I'm going to try them tonight. Oh. All right. So somebody said about favorite gins. Yeah. Um, here are some of my favorites. Um, I tend to go traditional. Um, there are a lot of good modern gins out there right now that make good martinis. Um, like uh, Dorothy Parker Gin and Ford's Gin and Jay Rieger Midwestern Dry Gin. There are quite a few, but I, I'm a traditionalist and I go with the London Dry. So here's Tanqueray. That's a, that'll make you a classic martini out of London. Um, if you want a very different sort of martini, kind of a soft, elegant one, uh, you got Plymouth Gin. If you do Plymouth Gin, I would recommend pairing it with uh, Dolan um, Dry Vermouth as opposed to Noli Pratt. Uh, here's Gordon's. Gordon's doesn't have a great reputation in the United States because we get um, the bad Gordon's, which is only 40% alcohol. But if you go to duty free, if you fly to London, yeah, well one day we'll fly to London again. And then you can pick up this, which has an alcoholic content of 47.3%, and that makes a big difference. But my favorite gin for making dry martinis is beefier. Now you can tell that we are in very tough times right now because you can't get beef eater gin. I went to two different liquor stores in the past week asking for beef eater gin and it was all gone. Two? Two. 
Well, I'm trying to be safe and not going out so many times. <laughs> oh, Emily Timberlake's here. She said her grandpa ordered a dry martini with no vermouth. What's that? Well, <laughs> Emily Timberlake, my uh, former editor at 10 Speed Press, said her grandfather ordered a uh, martini with no vermouth. And, and what is that called? And that's called a cold glass of gin. That's what that is. Um, so, but I was lucky because I had some beef eater at home, but this is um, old beef eater, vintage beef eater, antique beef eater. We found it. Um, I'm not going to say where, but we found it. <laughs> Um, and it's from the 1960s, and let me tell you, beef eater from the 1960s tastes the same as beef eater today, which is a beautiful thing. All right, so we're gonna make a dry martini. Now, I'm not insane, so I don't want like a 25 to one dry martini or a 10 to one dry martini. So I'm gonna compromise a bit. We're gonna go four to one. Yeah, that sounds about right. Maybe three to one. Um, that's dry enough for me because I like to taste the vermouth. I think vermouth is um, part Martin Duderoff's here. Martin, I just drank a sweet martini, Martin. You would have been happy and proud of me. Um, so I'm going to use this. Now, you may notice that this is glass. Most jiggers are metal, but this is a glass jigger. There is uh, a camp out there that believes if you're making a martini and you want to make it perfectly, it should not come into contact with metal. So I've adopted this policy. I don't know if it's true, but it's fun to think it is true. And so we're using a glass jigger so here we go. Somebody wants to know if you like Boodle's gin. Is that a gin? Boodle's gin is a gin, and yes, I like it. I haven't had it in a long time, but uh, that's a good gin. All right. There are, I also like uh, Bombay gin. Not the Bombay Sapphire, but the regular Bombay. Um, that makes a good solid um, martini. Uh, Old Raj, which is kind of unusual. It's a high alcohol content, but it's got um, saffron in it. It makes it a little yellow. That makes a, a good martini. Okay, so where's the Noli Pratt? Someone's, John says Brokers. Is that a gin? Yes, that's a gin too. That's a good one. Yeah. That's the one with the little derby on the uh, cap, isn't it? And you like blue gin too. Yes, I do like blue gin, but it costs $65 a bottle, so that's for special occasions. <laughs> so, hint, hint, you know. <laughs> You want to send me a bottle of gin? There you go. All right, so now we're going in the room. Uh, Noli Pratt, great old French brand. Goes very well with Beef Eater. Both very strong customers. A lot of uh, strong flavors there. Um, the original uh, martini recipe actually called for orange bitters. Orange bitters were lost for a long time, and then they came back, and now we have a lot of orange bitters. Um, I'm using Fee Brothers. Um, which is up in Rochester, New York. For a long time, these were the only orange bitters that were made in the United States. Um, so, a couple dashes of that. I um, mean, you don't have to do the orange bitters, but technically, bitters are, uh, by, na by definition, what makes a cocktail a cocktail. So, there we go. Time for ice again. All right. So, even more so than the sweet one, this dry martini, you want to get it really, really really cold. Looks like Rochester's in the house. Oh really? Someone from Rochester? Uh huh. I love Rochester. Great town. Great yeah. town. Great yep. bars. Great cocktail bars. All right. Let's, you know, you can never skimp too much on ice. And uh, if it gets colder, it gets colder. Um, again, with the glass thing, this is a glass stir as opposed to a metal spoon. I have these custom made by a glass maker in Corning, uh, New York. If you notice, the top is a martini glass and it has a little olive in it. Nice. So, and I'm gonna stir this for about 15 to 30 seconds. Um, you shouldn't be uh, worried about diluting your martini a little bit. That's what the stirring is for. <laughs> um, the martini is a very strong drink. You do not want to drink it just by itself. Like, if you're just putting gin and vermouth in the freezer and then taking it out and drinking it, you know, like a Duke's martini, I mean, that's very lethal. You're gonna want a little water in there. Um, don't worry, it'll still be a strong drink. Emily wants to know if you've ever had Sir Boodleton's gin before. She's making it up. No, Emily. Are you making that up? <laughs> Sir Boodleton's gin? That's like Sir Kensington's ketchup, you know? It's like, all right, so here we go. Now... Ooh, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. This is great. So I made enough for two, so Mary Kate can have a cocktail. Um, if you are quarantining with someone, 
you are very lucky and because then you can have cocktails for two every night. Um, so let's, there we go. Now there's a big debate between stirring and shaking. I stir as you just saw. And the main reason I do that is because of this. I love that uh, clear, calm, crystalline look to the drink. If you shake it, it'll still be a cold drink. It'll probably taste good, but it'll look a little cloudy. And I don't like that cloudy look. Um, with all cocktails, there's an expression um, in bars, you, you drink first with your eyes. So the cocktail is in front of you and you see it first before you smell it and taste it. So, um, again with the garnishes, at this point uh, in the history of the martini, you've got the dry martini, you really got two choices. You've got olives and you've got a lemon twist. Olives predominate, olives are more popular. Um, the classic image of a martini that we all know, martini glass has an olive in it. I prefer a lemon twist. Um, I think a lot of gins have citrus in them as a botanical, and so there's a natural marriage between the botanicals and the gin and the twist. Uh, some people go both, um, olives and a twist, which is also nice. So, and so what you do is you take your twist, these are pre-cut, so I made them look pretty, um, and you put it over there, and then you just squeeze it so that the, um, let's do this one first. Uh, you saw that you, the, um, the, uh, it expresses all the citrus oils on the surface of the glass. And uh, it also lends the glass this lovely aroma. And uh, that one's yours, Mary Kate. Nice. All right. Cheers. Cheers. All right. So that's the martini. Um, we're getting closer to cocktail hour. It's what, 4 30? Oh, um, Brad wants to know if you're anti 50 50 because he likes them. Ah. Good question. Brad Thomas Parsons asked me about 50-50 martinis. 50-50 martinis are just uh, what they sound like. It's equal parts dry gin and dry vermouth. Um, and they have become very popular in the past 15 years, very trendy. Um, the place that started serving them in bulk uh, was Pegu Club, which opened in 2005. And I have nothing against the 50-50 martini. It's a nice uh, version of the drink um, if you want a kind of an aperitif type uh, martini. It's also lower in alcohol because there is more vermouth. So you could have like one or two before your dinner. And it's just more easy going. If you'd ask me for my preference, I would go with the dry one. Clarkson Potter wants to know, well, Emily says it's not a martini. And Clarkson <laughs> Potter wants not, to know. I'm not taking that bait. And Clarkson Potter wants to know, what do you think about martinis with cocktail onions? What do I think about martinis with cocktail onions? Well, I think a lot of them. Um, I actually liked Gibson's before I liked martinis. Um, a martini with a cocktail onion is a Gibson. That's what it's called. That's the only difference is the onion. And there is a debate as to whether it is its own separate cocktail with its own identity and personality, or whether it's just a martini with a cocktail onion. And I can see both sides of that argument. I think the onion brings enough different flavors to the drink that it's a different drink. Is an Alaska, um, David Leibowitz wants to know, is an Alaska considered a martini? It's not considered a martini. Is an Alaska considered a martini? But it's a martini variation whenever anybody talks about the Alaska. Now the Alaska is two parts gin and one part yellow chartreuse. And it dates back to like 1910. Um, but people say it's a martini variation. It's just not different enough to be something else. Um, so Alaskas have come back lately. And a little tip, if, you're making a, if you like Alaskas and you make them at home, um, I make them with Old Tom gin, not dry gin, and I think it makes a world of difference. You're right. It's a better drink. Your brother wants to know if the water that you make the ice with matters. Yes, that, uh, my brother Eric Simonson is tuning in from Los Angeles. Hi, Eric. Um, oh, M Attaboy McElroy says good drink. Uh, yes, well, uh, for the martini? I don't know. Okay, um, so my brother asked, does the ice matter? Yes, it matters. You want good quality ice. It doesn't have to be fancy ice. It just has to be fresh ice. So if your ice has been hanging out in the freezer for days or weeks, it's picked up some of the aromas of the freezer, and it might be a little off. 
So change your ice regularly. If you know you're going to be like making martinis or cocktails that night, maybe you want to like uh, freeze some fresh ice in the morning. And what about the vermouth? What about the vermouth? Yes. That's my question, because oh, when oh. we first dated, I had the yes, vermouth um, on the counter. And Mary Kay uh, said I should talk about the vermouth, and the vermouth is very important. Um, one of the reasons that many cocktails that have vermouth got a bad reputation for a long time is that bars were serving spoiled vermouth. The vermouth is a wine, so once you open it, you should put it in the fridge, and it will last between two weeks and a month. But if you put, leave it out on the counter, it's not going to last much longer. I recommend um, people buy the smaller bottles of vermouth, uh, 375 milliliters. Hey. Um, spoiled vermouth is not much of a problem around here. Uh, vermouth doesn't last very long. There's Chloe. Say hi, Chloe. Hi, Chloe. And the Quarantine Cocktail Club wants to know about the Tuxedo Turf Club debate. Uh, somebody has asked about the Tuxedo Turf Club debate. Both the Tuxedo um, and the Turf Club I are... Lost you. I've had to put my martini down, sorry. <laughs> hey, cameraman, keep the <laughs> Steady hands. Steady hands. All right, so both the Tuxedo and the Turf Club were early variations of the martini. Uh, the Turf Club was actually around the same time as the martini <laughs> was born, and they are kind of, you know, got confused. So I'm not clear when you say the Tuxedo Turf Club debate what the debate is. I don't know how to go back in the questions, so... That's okay. Maybe they'll ask. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Something about where, if the martini was started or originated in Martinez, is that a question? Yes. Yeah, so there are popular theories as to where the martini was born. Uh, one of them has to do with Martinez, a city in California. One has to do with San Francisco. One has to do with New York City. Um, the frustrating truth is we do not know. There is no proof where the martini was invented or who invented it or even how it got its name. Um, this is just the way it is. But you have to think of the martini as a very simple drink. It's, it's just two things. It's some kind of gin and some kind of vermouth and maybe bitters. So probably a lot of people came up with that idea at the same time back in the 1880s. Um, so there, there's no one inventor or one hometown for the martini. Oh, somebody wants me to spring for a tripod so that I can drink. <laughs> that's smart. That's smart. Tripod. But I like the uh, I like the handheld, you know, thing, you know. Yeah, it's fun. very it's real. Yeah, that's we're, right. We're totally about also, transparency here. Because we're not doing the selfie mode, all the bottles, all the printing is, uh, you know, is on the right side, it's not reversed. Yeah, people can read it, David Leibowitz. See? <laughs> I have a purpose. All right, any, uh, we'll take like two more questions, if there are. <laughs> Somebody said, do you like Tribuno Italian uh, vermouth? And then Martin jumped in and said, Tribuno isn't Italian, it's American. And the only place I'm allowed to use that is in the clams. The question is, do I like Tribuno uh, vermouth? Um, I'm just going to say no. I put it in the clams. <laughs> we're going to leave it at that. When you go into the liquor store, the Tribuno is on the bottom shelf. There is a reason. Oh, ouch. <laughs> ouch. One more question, and then people have to get to their actual happy hour. You know, this is interesting because Kathleen wants to know what are the, what's the best food to go with martinis, and we're starting to make a lot of our own bar food. So what yeah. do you think? What best do you th food to go with martinis. Um, it's important to have some snacks on the side. You don't want to be just drinking these drinks, and the people who say that, you know, the olives are the food, you know, that's not enough food. So, I don't know. I would just say whatever you like to eat. Whatever I like a piece of la air. My, a little cheese, a little, little meat. Um, people drink martinis with steak at steakhouses. Uh, there's always the usual nuts. And you could have a bowl of olives. They go with everything. Yeah, they kind of go with everything. Oh, they go wonderfully with oysters. If you have oysters, uh, get a dozen oysters and some dry martinis and... And that's a feast. David Leibowitz likes them with Fritos. Because Fritos go with everything, too. And Fritos, <laughs> according to David Leibowitz. I mean, you know, why not Bugles, for that matter? <laughs> <laughs> you can put them on your fingertips and drink the martini, then. The Bugles. All right. Well, this has been a lot of fun. It's been nice making martinis with you out there. And I'm talking to all these friends from uh, all over the world and 
all over the uh, country. Um, everybody, I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and uh, sane. Um, cocktails can help. Um, we'd like to thank Mary Kate for her camera work. Thank Yay. you, Mary Kate. Yay. And tune in uh, next week at this uh, same station at this same time for the next happy hour hosted by John Bonet, who just lives a few blocks from And there. if they have questions, they can DM. And if you have any further questions, feel free to uh, direct message me on Instagram and I will answer any martini questions. Um, I will answer any alcohol questions. Helen Regardless, Bull, this is here. There's Bye, the book Helen. again. This will please the publisher. Yep. It's uh, We have no bookstores anymore right now, but available online. So, um, thank cheers. you. Chin chin. Cheers. Bye bye.